My brothers and sisters, you and I know that what is of utmost importance is knowledge. And when we say knowledge, it is divided into several categories. We have knowledge that some would consider solely and only religious knowledge. When we use the term ilm, we actually refer to more to religious knowledge when we say ilm. However, we should not become oblivious of the fact that secular knowledge is also considered as part of knowledge. The study of biology and history and geography and physics, chemistry, mathematics, language, all that is also a part of knowledge. That which conforms to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed will be considered that which there is an encouragement for every single one of us to understand, to pursue, to respect, and to make sure that we take a portion of that which is necessary and sometimes over and above that which might be extremely necessary in order to convey it to others. You have a mathematics teacher, for example, he or she may know so many concepts that they don't really need in their lives for themselves, but they need it to teach others because it might apply in someone else's life. The same applies, wallahi, my brothers and sisters, when it comes to the knowledge of Islam, when it comes to the knowledge of the Sharia, when it comes to the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, we need to understand that we might not need certain aspects of that particular knowledge for our own lives, but we will need it in order for us to convey it to others. I give you an example. A poor person or someone who doesn't have wealth and they know about all the rules of Hajj and the regulations of Hajj and the nitty gritties and the small basics and every fine detail. But you might ask them, my brother, why are you learning this when you can't even afford it? And you know Allah says, Indeed, Allah has made Hajj incumbent upon those who can afford it, those who can manage. You can't afford it, you can't even manage, you can't even cope. Why are you learning all the rules and regulations? You and I will say, we will respond that it is an act of worship to know those rules and regulations even if you cannot afford the trip because minimum is you will know it, you will make dua for others, you will be able to guide those who are going. Subhanallah, you become a knowledgeable person. How many of the sheikhs and the scholars are not wealthy enough to afford the journey, but they are the ones who hold the classes for the rest of the hujjaj to say, come, let me teach you what's going to happen, what's right, what's wrong. From Mecca and Arafah and so on, we will call, we will phone some of the scholars we know who are back at home. Hey, this is a problem I faced. How should I do, or how should I resolve this matter, etc.? It is absolutely important for us to understand the value of this knowledge. So where is this deen from? And where is this knowledge from? What is the source of it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has his own names and qualities. From amongst his names, the one who has complete knowledge of all aspects of the unseen in absolute totality. The one who is the knower of that which is seen and that which is unseen completely the knower of everything al-alim al-alim is the one who has the most intricate and detailed of knowledge of every single aspect of existence that is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala none can compete with the knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however he gives whomsoever he wishes from his favor he gives whomsoever he wishes from that knowledge of his so we take a look at revelation Revelation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He speaks about his word, his kalam. We all know the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know the value of the Quran. We all understand and we realize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept as a favor for those who have taken his word, learnt it, put it into practice and tried to convey it to others. You know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, khayrukum. The best from amongst you are those who have learned the Quran and taught it to others. You learn it. And some people think, well, what aspect of the learning of the Quran is being referred to? The reality is 
all aspects and angles, starting with the recitation, and then the meaning, and then the rules and regulations, and then the putting into practice, and then the conveying of all of that to others, the perfecting of it, the ability to apply the verses in our lives. We read the stories of so many of the messengers. They are not mere tales. No, they are not. But they are stories in which lots of lessons have been placed for all of us in our own lives. When you read the story, for example, of Nuh or the prophet Noah, may peace be upon him, the lessons are for all of us. We have so many lessons. One of the lessons I can quickly draw is, you may have a pious person whose children may not be as pious as the father or the mother, and vice versa. Nuh alayhi salatu was salam with his son. You and I may have read that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So Allah speaks subhanahu wa ta'ala about this Quran. You know what he says? Nazala bihir ruhul aminu ala qalbika li takuna min al mundhirin. In Surah al Shu'ara, Allah says, Ar-Ruhul Aminu has come down with the Quran. Allah revealed the Quran. Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam, the archangel Gabriel, may peace be upon him, the trustworthy, the one who was trustworthy. Allah sent him down with revelation to the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. To the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, engraved, enshrined. Subhanallah. It was revelation from Allah to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a gift. My brothers and sisters, value that. Value the fact that you are the ummah of the Quran. Not only by reading it. Many of us are guilty of not reading the Quran. Let's be honest. How many of us pick up the Quran regularly and read a portion of it? Wallahi, we don't. And yet we are the ummah of the Quran. The most powerful word in existence is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's your relationship with that particular word? I'm sure we can improve it, my brothers and sisters. Let's undertake here and now, beautiful day, Friday, the blessed day of the week, the Eid of the Muslimin. Undertake that you will do more regarding your relationship with the Quran. However, let's continue further. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he revealed it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that particular time, how did people used to record the Quran. How did they used to record matters of importance? Did you know that even the year that people were born was remembered through some incident that occurred? So for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they'll tell you he was born in the year of the elephant. The year of the elephant. What is the year of the elephant? They will tell you, oh, that was the year when Abraha from Yemen tried to attack the, Mac the Kaaba in Mecca because he wanted people to go to Yemen rather than come to Mecca. Oh, so what was that year called? The year of the elephant, subhanallah. People used to say this man was born two years after the year of elephant, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. That's how they used to keep the records. And because the bulk of them were unlettered, unlettered does not mean uneducated. It only means the inability to read or write for a reason. So they were highly educated, but they were unlettered. Remember this, that was there. You might not understand it today, but if you sit and ponder and pause and go back, it is something chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were highly educated people, but they were unlettered. How many of us are lettered, which means we can read and write, but we are not educated. We really don't have much. We don't have this common sense and logic. We create problems more than solutions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So it's, it shows you that being able to read and write is not everything. However, at that particular time, they used to record things. They had a memory whereby they knew the lineages of their camels going back seven generations. We don't even know our own lineage going back four generations. Reality? Tell me who, who was more educated. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Sahaba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions, you would ask them about the camel sitting there. They would tell you the lineage of the camel. They would give you the whole rundown, breakdown. They knew their own lineages going back 15 generations. You could take back the lineage of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all the way back to Adam alayhi salam. Possible. At least to Ibrahim alayhi salam, that could be rattled straight. 
And the same would happen to the Arabs themselves. They would know you and I, we are cousins. Our 15th or our 12th grandfather was the same person. How many of us, wallahi, we are related, close range. I'm talking of five or six grandfathers up and we don't have a clue. We don't even have an idea. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we need to fulfill the rights of kinship, the family ties. How will we be able to fulfill family ties when we don't even know who our family is? May Allah forgive us. This is why to study your lineage and to be able to go back and look at who you were to be involved in these family trees. It is an act of worship. It is an ibadah. I encourage you to do that for the sake of Allah and for your own sake to be able to go back to fulfill the acts of worship that Allah has ordained upon you. So now let's go back to where I'm heading. One might ask, where are you heading? Where is all this going? Subhanallah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began reciting the verses of the Quran. The verses of the Quran were so powerful that even the little children memorized them. You know when Abu Lahab insulted Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he had got up Mount Safa and Abu Lahab said his words, infamous words, Tabbal laka ya Muhammad, destruction be upon you, O Muhammad. Is this, is, why, is this why you gathered us? And verses were revealed. Destruction be upon both hands of Abu Lahab. His wealth and whatever he has earned will not help him or has not helped him at all. The children began to say these verses in the gullies and alleys of Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. Did they write them down? No, they couldn't read or write. But they knew the verses, powerful memory. That was the in thing. That was the technology, so to speak, of the time. People had memories. They knew this man has a better memory than this one. But their memories, all of them, were more powerful than the most powerful from amongst us today. Today we've become so lazy that you and I cannot memorize phone numbers of our own family members because the phone does it. But I recall 15 years back, I could rattle out 100 phone numbers minimum. And I'm sure a lot of us could. What happened? Technology has made us lazy. But at that time, they knew everything. So the Prophet wasallam used to read the verses. The people used to memorize them. Later on, there came a time when a few of them used to write down for purposes of reference to make sure it goes down the generations. The few who could write it, they were known as scribes of revelation. Kuttabul Wahi. They started writing. At the time, Muhammad wasallam himself prohibited the recording of his own words so that they don't get confused with the words of Allah. Not for any other reason. It was the writing of the words of the Quran because Allah's kalam needed to be preserved more desperately than anything else. So nobody should say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam denied that his own words should be written because he didn't want them to be written. No, because there was a priority and that priority needed to be addressed immediately so they started writing things and they had parchments this one wrote some that one wrote some there came a time after muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when they gathered this in a specific way that's not my topic but there came a time thereafter once the quran was gathered years later more than a hundred years later the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam started becoming of importance in terms of being gathered it was always there. The memory was there. The people knew who said what and when they said and how they said it and so on. It was passed on, but it was passed on by word of mouth. Now let's record it. Like when you sit with an old man sometimes in your own family, he'll tell you, you know, that man in Cape Town is related to you because his uncle's auntie's mother's nephew is actually your fourth order cousin. You got to say, dad, let me write it down. Because if you, if I don't write it down, it's lost. Do you agree with what I'm saying? But dad knew it, didn't he? The new generation won't know it because nobody wrote it down. Well, what happened at the time, they knew that Abu Hurairah anhu said this to this man and this man said it to another man. Two or three people in the, in the line of narrators, the chain of narrators, they knew it. And what happened is, they started writing it. When they started writing it, obviously now you have some charmers who come up, they want their names in the books. So they say, hey, the prophet peace be upon him said this and that. Well, where did you hear it from? Mm, my father. 
Where did he hear it from? Mm, my grandfather. Where else did he hear it from? Mm, my great grandfather. And so on. Are you sure? So what happened is the scholars of hadith came about. And these scholars had strict rules that they followed. If these two people did not live at the same time, same place, we won't accept their hadith. If anyone in society and community has had one person who's upright say that he's dishonest, we won't accept what he says. Imagine how many of us would actually be acceptable. I want to ask you the question for our own benefit. How many of us would be able to say not a single person who is upright has actually said we are dishonest? Allahu Akbar. Or we are crooks or crooked or whatever else you want. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us not only from bad words, but from actually being that bad. Two things. One is when people say you're bad and you know you're not bad. But two is when you really are bad and you're trying to defend yourself to say, no way, I'm not bad. A man can lie and then he gets up and defends his reputation. And my brother, your face is already telling us that you're telling a lie. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never do that to us. So at that particular time, one might ask, why was the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu recorded a hundred years later, 150 years later? Why? Simple, because that wasn't the in thing. It's like asking them, why wasn't the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu on the internet? There was no internet at the time. Are you following? There were no chips at the time. I'm talking of these little computer chips, memory cards, memory sticks. Today it's there because technology as it came, so the recording of that item has now changed in terms of where it is recorded. Are you following what I'm saying? Be careful because there are people who don't believe in the Sunnah at all. They say this is the Quran and that's it. We don't take anything else. We want to tell them the same happened to the Quran. And the one who brought you the Quran, the same one whose Sunnah we are talking about. Subhanallah. Yes, when it comes to the Quran, no dispute whatsoever. When it comes to the Sunnah, you need a little bit of education regarding the Sunnah. I'm talking of the Hadith, the statements of the Prophet ﷺ, his confirmations and a lot of other aspects of his living was gathered. And when it was gathered, you need to know if it was authentic or not. You cannot just accept anything, anyone coming and saying the Prophet ﷺ said, you got to stand on one foot when you're starting Salah, if that Salah is at the time of the Zenith. Come on, that's foolish. You will just nod your head and say, this man needs a bit of a visit to the psychiatrist or the psychologist or whoever else. Okay? But at the same time, my beloved brothers and sisters, what you do need to know is, as a Muslim, you need to make an effort to authenticate things. You need to make an effort to learn things. People have already done a lot before you. Make use of it. I give you an example. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi. His name was Muhammad ibn Ismail. You know, when you say Imam Bukhari, 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 a lot of people say, hey, that's a, not a common name. Well, he was from a place called Bukhara. So it's got to do more with where he came from. His name was Muhammad and his father's name was Ismail. At least something I have in common, alhamdulillah. Muhammad ibn Ismail, that was his name, Al-Bukhari. What did he do? He was one of them. But he compiled many books, not just the Sahih, Al-Bukhari that we know. It was called Al-Jami' al-Sahih. That's not the only book. He compiled many books, but that particular book, he compiled it in a specific way. The most strict ever. He says, if I had the slightest doubt that this was not authentic, I dropped it out of the book. I recorded it elsewhere. He has other books. For example, Al-Adab Al-Mufrad is a book of Al-Bukhari. It's not Sahih Al-Bukhari. It's another book. It's like an author who's written 200 books and one of them is very famous. You know, they'll tell you Ayd al-Qarni, he's written a book, don't be sad. That's not his only book. There are so many other books, but that's the famous book. The same applies when it comes to Al-Bukhari. People say, this is Bukhari. And they bring you one book. They don't know this is Al-Jami al-Sahih of Al-Bukhari, but Bukhari has written so many other books. So in that particular book, it is reported, and inshallah, we probably will see this in weeks to come. It is reported that he took great care regarding these ahadith. It was an amana. Any doubt, even if a person cheated an animal in his life, he wouldn't take the hadith from them. He wouldn't take the hadith. 
It is reported in one narration that once he went to go and get a hadith from a certain man and he traveled a long distance, days to go there. He waited at night and the following morning he saw that this person who he came to get the hadith from had actually lifted his thobe, you know, his clothing. And he came out pretending like there was something to eat in the clothing in order to let the donkey come near so that he could ride the donkey. And as the donkey came near, he released his clothing and jumped on the donkey. Imam Bukhari began to leave. He said, well, what are you here for? He says, I came for a hadith, but I cannot take hadith from a man who deceives the donkeys. So this is something we will learn. They have done a great job, subhanallah. And as time passed, many others, muhaddithin have come and they have told you, look, I heard from this man. He heard from that man, he heard from that man, and he heard from the other man who heard from Ali ibn Abi Talib or Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu or any one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu who heard from him and so on. And if they haven't clearly said, we heard it from him, a different word was used. So one is sami'tu, which means I heard. And one is an. An means it is reported that. You see the difference? There are different grades of hadith. If the entire hadith has an, 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 it has a different terminology that, it's that, that is used to refer to it. Its level of authenticity differs. But when a man tells you, I heard Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu say on the mimbar, in front of everyone, in the Jumu'ah, innama al-a'malu bin niyat. You know that that is true. It's come to us from so many sources and they've all said the same thing. It is called mutawatir. Mutawatir means la yumkin tawatu'ahum ala al-kadhib. They cannot lie. That's how many people they are. And they, they are not claiming to have heard from a third party. They all have heard it from the source. From the source. Today, you heard it from CNN. So I say, hey, this is the news. That's the news. Why? Because you heard it from CNN. Let me tell you, in hadith, CNN is not the end of the chain. No. You got to go further. Who put it on there? Who were the people who actually narrated the, the tale? And where did it come from? And what is the source of it? And how many people witnessed that from the source? Then we will talk. That's where hadith goes. Subhanallah. People have done us a favor. Islam is the only religion which has something known as ilmur rijal, the knowledge of men. Women are also included in it. But the knowledge of men means anyone who claims to have heard any hadith of the Prophet sallallahu even generations down until the compilers of hadith their names have been written dates of birth dates of death places they visited where they were what reputation they had in their societies what people had to say about them and so on so that when one like yourself and myself at the moment what happens is you have applications and you have computer programs that make it easy for us you have a chain of narrators you punch it in and you say, this man says he heard from this man who says he heard from that man who says he heard from that man. That computer will tell you these two didn't meet because they lived in different areas. This one died before that one was even born. You know this hadith, there's something wrong with it. The words at the end might not be a lie because you might find them from a different angle being true. But this particular chain is false. I hope you understand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. This is knowledge. So this is why appreciate that in Islam, there is something called the knowledge of men. Reputation of a man is vital. Your reputation, male or female, is absolutely vital. Make it your business to make sure. Allahu Akbar, something's come to my mind. I'll share it with you. Make it your business to make sure that your honesty is never ever doubted. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. I want to give you one example from his life. He was on a ship. And he was talking to one of his friends there, you know, someone he had met on there, not knowing exactly who he was. This man had carried the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. By the age of 19, 20, he was already done with the bulk of his work. That's how powerful he was. With us, 19, 20, we don't even know whether we're coming or going at that age yet. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So as he was on the ship, do you know what happened? Amazingly, he told his friend, you know what, I have a certain number of gold coins. I think it was 20 or 40 gold coins. I forget the exact figure. And these gold coins are with me and I've kept them in this red bag here, you know, just to make sure that no one steals them and so on. So this man decided to make an announcement to the captain to say, you know what, I've lost a bag. It's a red bag with X amount of gold coins. That was a large number of gold coins. Imagine the Krugerrands of today, you've got 20 of them in a bag. 
and someone says, I've lost it, and this is what it looks like, this is the bag. The captain started searching, and the people started searching. And when they started searching, guess what? They searched Bukhari. Guess what happened? Can someone guess? No, they didn't find it. I was waiting for someone to say they found it. They didn't find it. They searched high and low, but they didn't find it. And the man looked like a fool. Later on, Imam Bukhari was asked by this man, hey, I'm so sorry for having done what I did. You know, it was shaitan. Like I told you, we are Muslims. We are fortunate. We can blame the devil for our mistakes, isn't it? <laughs> hey, that was shaitan. My brother, forgive me. Nah, too late. Had you got it, you would have nailed me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So what happened is, he says, Imam Bukhari says, yeah, no, I, I, I saw what happened. And as soon as I heard it, I dropped the whole bag into the ocean. What did you do? You mean those gold coins? He says, Wallahi, yes, I dropped the whole bag into the ocean. You dropped all the gold. Are you crazy? He says, no, I have carried the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I thought in a split second that if this is found by me, everything goes down the drain that I've done in my life. I'd rather throw this bag. It's over. Take a look at this. With us in our lives. We are not prepared to give someone their right. This man has thrown away what was his in order to protect what was there. In terms of hadith, this is why it is known as Asahul Kutubi Ba'da Kitabillah. It is known as the most correct and authentic book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The man, he went to great lengths in order to bring to you what you have today. Sahih al-Bukhari. And then you have Imam Muslim. Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj al-Qushayri rahmatullahi alayhi. Abu Dawood, al-Tirmidhi, al-Nasai, and Ibn Majah al-Qazwini. These are powerful imams of hadith. What did they do? They recorded this at a time when the recording became the in thing. So don't ask, why did they delay so much? Or if you want to ask out of curiosity, you need to know that the answer is because it was not the in thing to write prior to that. The minute it became the in thing, they started writing. And later on, they, they transformed it into perhaps typing. And after that, it became into a computer. Today, it's on my phone. I have a little app whereby I can search any hadith. How did it get to that? Nobody can tell me why wasn't that app there 1500 years back. That's because the phones didn't even exist. That was not the in thing. So the people who recorded the hadith, they made sure that they did it thoroughly. And they made sure that when they were not certain, they gave you the whole chain. Why? It was up to you to go back to search the chain of narrators, each man. Find out, was he honest? Was he trustworthy? Sometimes he's honest and trustworthy, but his memory fails him. For example, a person tells you a story. The next time they tell you the story, there are two, three changes in it. If that is the case, you cannot accept revelation from that man. You and I know that hadith is a different type of revelation. He does not utter from his own whims and fancies, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, it is revelation inspired and revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the recording of the hadith was done in a sophisticated manner. Some of it, you can close your eyes and say, this is correct. And some of it, you have to go back and you have to search Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. He has written Al-Musnad, which has a large number of ahadith, arguably one of the biggest books of hadith. But he didn't say that every hadith in there is correct. He says, I have rec I've recorded these ahadith and I've recorded the chain of narrators. It's up to you to go and check the chain of narrators. So other scholars came later on who were checking chains of narration. And it's up to us also to check chains of narration. What I do normally is when you hear a hadith and within you it feels there's something wrong here or maybe I need to know a little bit more. Go back and check. Go and study. Go and pick up the books. Who was this man? You will see where he was born, who his teachers were, whom he's met in his life. And if the name of the other person is not there in that list, you know there's something wrong here. There is a whole study called the study of the chains of narrations, the study of hadith. You've got to look at the words. Like I say, sometimes there's a man who's honest, but his memory fails him. Sometimes some of the narrators, they say up to the age of 75, you take what he said. After that, he was a person who couldn't really remember. 
So what? It's not an insult. This is a matter of hadith. You cannot say they insulted me. They didn't insult you. They just wanted to make sure 100% that what you've said is the reality and it is the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and grant us ease. I've only started what I wanted to say and the time is up. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. I think I've introduced to you the crux of hadith and why it was recorded or how it was recorded, why the delay in the recording and some of the intricacies and the importance of this beautiful, vast topic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who are grateful. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. And may we be able to study the Quran and the Sunnah in a beautiful way. And may we be able to put it into practice. And may we be able to distinguish between that which is authentic and that which is not. And may we be from among those whom when we are resurrected on the day of judgment, we are from among those really who have succeeded. Because on that day, if you are given your book on your right hand, you have indeed succeeded. May Allah bless us all with Jannah and Firdaus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the goodness in this world and the next.